Good afternoon. Thank you, Sean. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining and attending this presentation. Uh, I know this, uh, the time of this presentation can be a little awkward. Some of you may be wanting to go for lunch, a uh, late lunch, and some of you may have just come back from lunch. So I will try and be uh, efficient and succinct and not keep you as long um, for, uh, for a long period of time. Uh, I hope I can grab your attention as we keep uh, the slide deck going. So uh, I'm going to talk about basically filing of a provisional application, demystifying, quote unquote, the filing process. Now, uh, one of the way, things I would like to say is I am a supervisor in the Pro Se Assistance Center. So I'm going to focus a lot of my conversation and talk and the slides towards more of Pro Se applicants. So some of you may be familiar with the process. Um, you may find the information a little redundant. However, um, if you can contribute with some questions uh, that may assist other pro se applicants, that would be great. So I'll begin. Um, I'm going to go over basically a generic overview of types of patents, uh, an overview of a provisional application, and the filing requirements. Uh, again, this is more catered and targeted to actually filing of the application and the content as opposed to the overarching uh, uh, process. Again, we have the United States provides three types of patents. So one is a utility patent, a design patent, and a plan patent. Um, in the utility patent can be obtained by anyone who invents, discovers a new and useful process, a machine, article of manufacture, a composition of matter. An example of a composition of matter could be, you know, ingredients, or chemicals, uh, pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceutical drugs is a very good example. You know, chemicals that we use in our day-to-day -day life, like shampoo or, you know, hand sanitizers or um, better hand sanitizers. Um, shampoo, for example, um, an example of a machine or a device or an apparatus could be like a bicycle or integrated circuit or any contraption for anything to do something, um, anything uh, that can be used for, for basically for any purpose. Um, the other thing is the term manufacture refers to articles that are made or manufactured. Example, for example, a tire, an integrated circuit. Again, you, uh, example of a machine and an article of manufacture are very similar, synonymous. Uh, so they generally refer to similar things. Uh, we also, like I said, the United States also has grants a design patent. A design patent may be obtained by anyone who invents a new original and ornamental design uh, for an article of manufacture. So an example would, of this would be, um, you know, how the look and feel of your iPhone, you know, it's, it's uh, rounded shape, it's, it's screen, the notch in the screen. Uh, those are more, think about it as more aesthetically looking or aesthetically visual features. Uh, that can, at times can be very important. Um, a, lot of, a lot of us make decisions on how something feels, how something looks, and how it's shaped, how the design is. So that's uh, another uh, concept that can be patented in the United States. Of course, the final uh, patent in the United States is a plant patent. Uh, this basically is anyone who invents a new or discovers a new type of uh, patent, and they can, that can also be filed. Uh, just uh, as an FYI, as, you will go, as I go through this presentation, a lot of my conversation will be limited or focused toward utility patents. Uh, utility uh, applications, uh, those are the vast majority of applications we find, even though we do see quite a bit of design applications, um, but, but a majority of, by a vast uh, amount, are utility type of applications. So let's go to give an overview of what is a provisional utility application. Again, the focus here, utility and provisional. A provisional application for patent is a U.S. national application filed in the USPTO for utility and plant inventions. Um, again, important to note, design inventions are not eligible for filing provisional applications. So a couple of things to note from this first bullet is that a provisional application is an application only that can be filed in the United States. It is a national application. 
and it can only be filed for an invention that is a utility invention or a plant invention. Now, why do we have this, uh, the, this type of an application and how does this application work? Firstly, it is a low cost, way to establish an early effective filing date, priority date with few formalities. Um, we get a lot of questions in the Pro Se Assistance Center uh, of what are the requirements and what is needed to get a patent. Um, and uh, you will see that the requirements are quite substantial to file a non-provisional application. So what, we, what the United States has done is created a new type of an application that is called a provisional application. It's lower in cost, has fewer formal requirements, and it has, is less cumbersome, but provides a way for you to enter into the patent system and begin the process of getting your uh, application matured into a patent. Um, in, the in the previous uh, presentation, uh, the presenter, Mr. Nolan, had given, gone over the overview of the, uh, the process of when you file an application. The details as the process that he outlined is not for a provisional application, it's for a non-provisional application. However, you can get in through the door with a provisional application in a cheaper manner and then have, get more time once you're more familiar and file a non-provisional application. So a provisional application also does not issue as a patent. This is very important concept a lot of people are, um, have, the, have the misconception that once they file a provisional application, they actually have a patent. That is not the case. Uh, a provisional application functions as a placeholder. It is a placeholder for a non-provisional application. And however, it gives you a 12-month period to get all the formal requirements set up and get ready before you file the application. And you will get the filing date of the provisional. So it gives you the date of the provisional, but gives you a 12 month period to do a lot of the legwork which you may deem appropriate or necessary for filing a non-provisional or to whether you deem it even appropriate for you to file a non-provisional and it's a low cost way of getting into the system. Like I mentioned, it provides a 12 month window to file a corresponding utility non-provisional application in order to benefit from the priority date of the provisional application. The provisional application automatically abandons after 12 months and is not examined. Okay, so the examination process and procedure that was outlined by Mr. Nolan earlier is refers to a non-provisional application. A provisional application, think of it as, a, again, as I mentioned, as a placeholder to get into the door. It's a cheap way, it's a cost-effective way to get your invention or get your idea formulated as an invention and filed as much as possible up front. And then it gives you a 12-month duration to fine-tune, to, to do your business analysis, whether you think you want to proceed with the non-provisional application because the costs are high. Okay, um, additional benefits of a provisional application. Uh, the patent term measured from the filing date of the subsequent non-provisional application. Uh, so this gives you one year additional, uh, you, you don't get the protection for an additional year, but you get the filing date of, of an additional year, okay? The patent term is currently 20 years from the date of filing provides up to an additional 12 months of protection on your invention based on filing of a non-provisional application. Once you file a provisional application, you can also uh, uh, put the term patent pending on your product, on your invention. Uh, you can use the uh, filing of a provisional application in your business plan, in your business model, as you are uh, using to seek the, the capital funding from a bank or venture capitalist, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think um, the, uh, the previous presenter, Mr. Nolan, had mentioned that once a patent expires, what can it be used for? One of the things he mentioned was it shows that you have contributed to the intellectual property, that you have the capability of your inventions, have the capability of clearing the hurdle of the, um, uh, 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 of the patent office. Uh, i.e. being new and non-obvious and, and so on and so forth. 
another way is if you file a provisional, you can also let uh, your investors, business partners, uh, prospective clients know that you are serious about this invention, that you have already begin the process of uh, getting a uh, issued patent, and that you have done the most of the paperwork, if not all of it, and this shows the seriousness of your uh, intent to various business uh, um, partners. Okay, so once you file a provisional application, uh, it's, it, it lasts for 12 months, and then you have an option to file a non-provisional application, which then goes through the examination process, as was outlined by Mr. Lawton, Mr. Mr. Nolan, and then you can either get an issued, issued patent granted or the application, non-provisional application may go abandoned. However, it's important to note from a provisional application perspective, no matter whether you file a non-provisional or not, it will abandon after 12 months. It's also very important to note that this period of 12 months is not extendable, not renewable, and is a, is a finite, definite uh, period that then your application gets abandoned. Provisional application, sorry. The non-provisional, of course, if you do file within that 12-month period of non-provisional, that will continue <clears throat> the prosecution. Uh, here are some of the requirements. Um, you need to have a title of the inventor, name of all the inventors, inventor's residence, correspondence address, attorney information, if you have an attorney, if applicable, uh, if you are uh, do going through the process yourself, you can leave that blank, not applicable. Um, if there is a government interest in this, in this invention, uh, funding, so on and so forth, um, a lot of times these requirements can be fulfilled by just filling out this form. Uh, it's called the PTO SB16. It can be found at our website. I have the link here on the slide. Uh, again, a lot of these, these requirements on this page are, can be um, fulfilled by filling out this form. Uh, so we encourage the use of this form, but however, if you don't use the form, as long as this information is presented, we will accept it. Some additional requirements. Uh, these are very important requirements. These are the gist of your invention. Basically, we want, uh, the office requires a detailed description of the invention that includes something along the lines of the background of the invention, a summary of the invention, drawings that describe the invention, and a detailed description of the, uh, of the, of the invention. So uh, uh, earlier there was a question as regards to can ideas be patented and so on and so forth. So it's very important to understand that ideas in and of themselves are not patentable, but ideas have to be translated to an invention. Uh, one of the process uh, of translating an idea to actually a concrete invention, a tangible invention, is to draft a, these requirements. Uh, these requirements are meant to convert various ideas people have, inventors have, uh, to make them more tangible, make them more understandable, make them more uh, definite, um, and so one of the ways to do that is to actually draft up a specification as I've outlined here. Also, of course, there's a filing fee, and you can get more details of each of these uh, subsections in, in the Manual of Patent Examining Procedure. Uh, the link is here. I will give a little bit uh, more description in the next slide, but for more details, uh, for so some of you have um, would like more questions and more questions answered and uh, so forth can go there. So here's a little bit more uh, uh, explanation, a summary of what each of those previous subsections are. You will see a lot of that I have put down here. So the title of the mention, the title of the mention should be brief, but technically accurate and descriptive, preferably from two to seven words long. Uh, this should be very short. It should be a way to convey a large degree of what you are inventing, but not uh, does not have to be uh, huge. Um, we do get titles that are greater than seven words. Uh, we do get titles that are a single word. Uh, it's not preferable, and examiner at his discretion <clears throat> may request a little bit more pertinent 
title if they see deem it more appropriate. Um, but again, these are just guidelines. These are not these are guidelines to the requirements. Um, these are not essentially uh, you know hard and fast uh, rules here. Uh, but these are required in the in the filing. Uh, a background is the statement of the field of art to which the invention pertains. And it could be a short paragraph that basically describes what field of invention you are you are inventing. Uh, like for example, if you have a wireless uh, hand, uh, if you have a cell phone you've invented uh, or want better cell phone, you may put a background of where you explain the current problems in the current cellular technology or current problems in the current you know telephonic technology and how uh, your invention goes about solving those problems or capturing uh, or making the uh, a product better, but just so you give the context of where this invention is in which field. Now, it may not be necessarily only in that field, but and you're not limited to only in that field, but it just gives a basic background of your invention. Uh, summary of the invention is very important. Uh, it sets out the exact nature, operation, and purpose of the invention. The summary should be directed specific to the invention being claimed in contradicts distinction to mere generalities of the invention. So think of it like this. Uh, background, to some degree, can have a higher level of generality because you're giving the general field where, where uh, which field this invention is in, how you're trying to solve these problems, or, or what problems you're trying to solve. Um, the summary is more specific, how you're trying to solve it, what is the issue, and what are the intricate details in, in, a, in a concise paragraph. Um, and then I will go down to the next one, which is the detailed description. A detailed description takes the summary to a little more of the detail from the summary. So think of it this way. The title is at, at the, at, in, in is the most general. Then you provide a little more, more context in the background. You provide a little bit more specific in, in your summary. And in your detailed description, you provide the intricate details the, of how your invention is, um, how it functions, how it's made, um, what is needed. Uh, the detail must be in such particularity as to enable a person's person skilled in the art or science to make and use the invention without extensive experimentation. In other words, you want to be specific exactly what your invention is how it is functioning, what is important, what is not important, what is the criticality of that invention, why is it critical, and all that stuff. So someone in that area, in that field of endeavor, again, if you, let me just give an example. If you're talking about a cell phone, someone who um, has worked on cell phone, an engineer or scientist. If we're talking about you know, a car, a tire, you know, someone who is a mechanic or someone who is a tire builder can know how, what is unique about your invention, your tire, uh, your cell phone, uh, your circuit, uh, you know, anything um, that you have invented. And then the drawings are important because the drawings complement the detailed description. A lot of the description, a lot of the detailed description refers back and forth to the drawings uh, and how it, it's the written word as opposed to a pictorial way of representing your invention. And the office requires both uh, um, for it to better understand the invention. Again, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of this is in much more detail here in this link uh, on the MPEP. Um, a lot of that language, as you have seen, uh, a lot of this language, as you have seen here in the slide, comes directly from there. <clears throat> but also, you, there you have a lot more details and a lot more legal language in case you want to be familiar with that as you uh, proceed in drafting your application. So, going to the next slide, the fees. Um, again, the fees is, uh, we, the office has purposely kept the fees of this type of an application um, low. It is low cost of entry. It is meant to encourage um, inventors, entrepreneurs, small businesses uh, who do not have uh, infinite resources or a lot of resources, uh, but we want the United States want to encourage 
invention, entrepreneurship, and advancement of technologies and inventions uh, for the country and for the rest of the world to keep it low. Um, also, uh, the office of the United States provides tiered system of fees. Uh, we have a large entity, small entity, and micro entity. Um, these are the qualifications of, of a micro entity. Um, a lot of times, if you do file, a lot of small pro se inventors are considered micro entity. Um, we have a form to fill out, and the form is right here on this link. If you fill out this form uh, and file it with the, uh, the other form, with this form, um, this form, which is the SB, uh, PTO SB 16, is the cover sheet form for the requirements. And if you file the SB PTO uh, 15A, which is the microentity form, together along with the uh, along with the specification and the invention, uh, you can get a, a discounted uh, fee. Uh, one thing to note, and I would like to bring this up, is uh, we generally uh, don't uh, change the fees very often, but there are times that our fees have changed over a period of time. In case um, uh, in case um, this fee is not applicable when you get the opportunity, when you're ready to file your application, um, what will happen is you can still pay this amount of fee as is listed here, and you will get a a, 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 um, a response from the office requesting additional fees uh, based on fee changes. So, you know, don't get shocked. Don't think it's abnormal. Uh, a lot of people, this happens to a lot of inventors, not only small, but large inventors too. Um, and it's not, a, it's not just a random uh, request for more money. It's just that the fees may have changed. Um, Furthermore, I'd just like to point out uh, the USPTO has a YouTube channel on which we have a video that assists in how to fill out this form. Uh, there's, there's some nuances uh, <coughs> in filling out the form. Uh, we, I urge and we in the office urge you to see the video before filling out the form. Um, a lot the, the slides in this video and the slides to fill out this form are on our website, which I will show you. Uh, in, in later slides. Um, I sincerely encourage you to visit our website and to look at these videos because what happens is you fill out something wrong and the agency will say a non-compliant form or non-compliant certification status. And that makes it harder to go back and forth uh, with the office and with the filing process. Uh, so. I encourage either you contact the Process Assistance Center or watch these videos or on our website, the slides. We have a lot of uh, toolkits. It's in our toolkit slides um, and also our video slides, uh, our video slides on our webpage. Going to the next, uh, here is the a very important um, information. Uh, um, uh, we have um, our, uh, the Process Assistance Center where I work, uh, you can make a appointment, one-on-one -on -one appointment, uh, either by calling the phone number uh, or sending an email requesting an appointment, or here's our website link. Uh, if you go to our website link, you will see that, um, you will see that uh, we have a lot of uh, useful material for pro se applicants, including our various toolkits. <clears throat> if, you, if you are inclined not to, um, file a provisional application and go directly to a non-provisional application. We have a slides on assisting you in how to fill, how to write up a non-provisional application. Uh, we have slides on giving you a, a more detailed introduction as to various intellectual property tools that are available from copyrights, trademarks, uh, patent applications, uh, and what, what invention you can fit in either of those categories, utility, so on and so forth. Um, we encourage you to go to that website. You can make an appointment directly on our website. We have a uh, make appointment button, and that is an automated process. The good thing is that that appointment is an hour one-on-one -on -one appointment that is dedicated to answering all your questions specific to you. 
it's available via WebEx, um, uh, 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 WebEx video conference, telephonic, and also email uh, questions, uh, whichever um, uh, media form you feel that may assist you the best. Um, we are available five days a week, and uh, you get to an opportunity to have a conversation with an examiner. Uh, it's very important. Generally, most applicants, unless the application is already being examined, don't get access to an, an examiner because they're busy working on their examination of other applications. You will get access to an app examiner or myself, a supervisory examiner, um, to answer your questions. Uh, they may not be, uh, we may not be experts in your technology or in your field of invention, uh, but we can answer questions uh, to assist you. Uh, this also is if you get a non-compliant or communicated correspondence uh, <clears throat> from the office and don't understand what is actually required, we do a lot of helping for small inventors, small businesses, uh, who want to know actually what exactly is needed uh, to complete their filing, to complete what's missing, uh, to respond to an office action, uh, assistance in responding to an office action, explaining what that is, uh, and also helping in assisting you in writing the application to the extent it's not legal and to the extent giving you uh, some information uh, because a lot of our um, examiners or myself may not be familiar with your technology, may not be familiar with your business strategy. Uh, so a lot of it is we can just give you answers as to what you may want to consider, but I think it can be very useful. And that's all I have. Uh, questions? Sean? Okay, Sanancho. Thank you. I actually have quite a bit of questions, so I'm glad you left plenty of time for that. So I'll good, start with our, first. our first question coming in is, can the 12-month term of the provisional application be extended or renewed? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, no, it cannot. That's a very good question, and it's, a lot of people have a misunderstanding in regards to this. They will, we did a lot of small inventors, small businesses, entrepreneurs will call us or get in touch with us to say, my provisional application is expiring tomorrow. Can I extend it by another month while I'm writing up my non-provisional application? And unfortunately, uh, we have no discretion in the office. It's a statutory requirement. It, it expires. It's not renewable after 12 months. Okay. The next question I have, is a provisional application examined or published, made public? Another very good question. Uh, again, the provisional application is not, and I repeat, not examined. It is a placeholder to give the inventor, entrepreneur, or small business person and 12 months to make a decision whether to file a non-provisional application, which indeed is examined as the process outlined by Mr. Nolan, uh, and is this, a provisional application is also not published unless your non-provisional application is, is matures into an issued patent. If your non-provisional application issues into a, is, matures into an issued patent, uh, it, the patent application is made. The patent um, uh, is made public, so is the provisional application, but only if it issues as a patent. If it does not, if it is, if it is abandoned, and or if the non-provisional is abandoned, it is not made public. This is a good question because a lot of people feel that once they write out their invention, file it into the patent office, that someone will steal it from them. If rest assured that the provisional application is not published. It is only published after you've already gotten a patent, and so the invention itself is public. Excellent. Just a reminder to everybody watching, these videos will be made public after the program. We will edit them to make sure that captioning is included. So if you're not capturing all of the information quick enough by notes, you can watch these videos again online. Sudanshu, our next question coming in is, what is the main difference between a provisional 
and a non-provisional application? Uh, good question. Now, um, there are a lot of differences, there are a lot of subtle differences, but I would say uh, the biggest main difference is that a provisional application does not require you to draft or write claims. Claims are the uh, part of the application which, for which you are getting the legal coverage, legal protection. That is not required in the provisional application. It can be in it if you desire to put it in it, but it is a requirement in a non-provisional application. And the examiner in a non-provisional application is primarily focusing on examining of the claim. That's a big difference, and that is one of the reasons I say is what happens is, an example, let me explain why this can become important. So you draft your provisional application, you have all the details, all the intricacies, and you put it in, you file it, everything is good. You have 12 months to write your non-provisional, specifically, let's say, just the claim. Okay, so now, while you have that 12-month period, you're going to your partners, you're going to prospective clients, you're going to prospective customers, you're going to prospective venture capitalist people, uh, banks, and you realize, hey, the key part of my invention is this. This is where the market is. So what you can do is draft your claims when you draft the non-provisional, focusing on only that part of the specification of the invention that you've already drafted to claims can be focused at that part, which you feel is the most valuable in terms of the business, in terms of where you want to get the market share, and what the, what the, what the society or what the, the country needs at that particular time. That is the biggest difference. Having said that, the specification, by and large, and I use the words by and large very specifically because uh, there's no hard and fast rule. Whatever you put in your non-provisional must at least be supported in what you have filed in the provisional to get the date of the provisional. I hope I've answered that question. Absolutely. Thank you. The next question coming in is, how many times can an applicant file the same utility provisional patent? You can file, you only will file, you can file it once, you can file it again with slight modification if you do need it, but you won't get the date of the earlier one. Um, as your invention changes, you may file another one, but the new provisional one will have the new date and will have the new 12 month period. You will not get per credit for the previously filed provisional. Okay. Our next question, how do you define new specifications that meet an examiner's, pro I'm sorry, how do you define new specifications that meet an examiner's approval? A new specification, is that correct? Correct. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, that, that's a, another good question. So this goes to my earlier point, which I was answering is that the specification in the non-provisional must be supported by the specification or the disclosure in the provisional application. You can file another. Uh, you can file another specification when you're filing a, a provisional. Uh, a, a, sorry, a non-provisional later on. But it must be supported at least by the by the provisional. Now this is a gray and a very subjective uh, concept because one must be able to articulate what it means to be supported. Uh, I would say to you is um, if you have the general concepts, general idea. Uh, in reasonable amount of detail in your provisional, as you take that one additional year period to refine your invention, to make your invention more pertinent to the marketplace or to your business plan, you can modify it, make it more specific. However, the general ideas and concepts must be supported in the original application if you want the priority of the provisional. So there, come, there can be instances, and, and there's nothing wrong with this, again, uh, there may be instances where the examiner may say, look, your new disclosure in this non-provisional is not supported by the provisional that you filed earlier. And there may be a disagreement and there may be exceptions. In that case, the only thing is you're not getting that priority of the 12 months. 
you will still you can still prosecute your non-provisional application accordingly. Okay. The next question coming in: Do you need to make claims in a provisional application? No, you do not need to make claims in the provisional application. Uh, you can, may have claims if you wish. You can change them in the non-provisional later on. So you, that's a very good question. So you don't have to have it. You can have it. If you do have it, you can change it. Uh, so you, there's a lot of flexibility uh, in drafting of a provisional application. Okay. Next question coming in, should a pro se inventor utilizing the pro se assistance center first send a non-disclosure, non-compete agreement over first before utilizing the services? If not, what protections does the pro se assistance center have in place to protect intellectual property of individuals utilizing the service? Uh, I presume you're referring to uh, protection from the pro se assistance center. So uh, you do not, if, if any document, any information sent to the pro se assistance center is confidential, is not made public. And, and our employees are not allowed to use it or not allowed to file an invention related to it. Uh, so any information sent to us in the pro se assistance center are USPTO government employees the examiners who are who who can be called in to assist in answering questions or looking at documents uh, are also bound by that confidentiality and also bound by the fact that they can't file for patent inventions. Um, so as far as uh, any uh, conflict of interest or any protection against USPTO employees and the Pro State Assistance Center, uh, no, nothing additional is needed. Your 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 in any information provided to us is confidential. Thank you. The next question is, does an applicant have a specific period before filing a provisional once the product has been made publicly known? Um, if the product is made, that's a very good question. If the product is made pub publicly known, you have a one year, um, which is a grace period to file your non-provisional application. You can file a provisional and you can file, uh, but eventually you will have one year uh, to uh, file a non-provisional. Um, however, if it is publicly made, if it is made publicly available by yourself, then you have additional protection. But if it was public, if the invention was made or it was made public by someone else, then you have a one year protection. Thank you. The next question, if a provisional application becomes abandoned, are there options to resubmit from scratch? No, you can file another provisional uh, for a separate invention, but that no, if it gets abandoned, it's abandoned uh, in its finality. Meaning you next... won't get, meaning you won't get the priority of that earlier provisional that got abandoned. You can file another provisional with the same information later on after that one year, and you will get that that the the, the new one year, the new twelve month grace period beginning from there from the new filing. But you won't get the one year additional from the prior filing that that has expired. And this next question may tie into that answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. When one provisional expires. Can I file a second with additional claims supported by prior art just before the expiry to keep the previous one alive and include the material from the previous application? You can't keep the previous one alive. That's not possible. It's not renewable. It's not extendable. If a provisional application expires, it expires. Like I said, having said that, you can file another one, you're just not gonna get the priority date. Again, uh, let me, uh, this is, these are very good questions and a lot of them uh, we can answer on a one-on-one -on -one basis in an appointment. But let me, let me uh, summarize this in, in one sense. A lot of these questions is, one of, the, one of the primary advantages of filing a provisional application is to get that 12-month priority date, okay? 
uh, remember, the United States is in a first-to-file system. So a first-to-file system means the first you further, the earlier you file, you are more likely to get less prior art applied against you, okay? And you will be given priority over someone who files later. So having said that, um, if a provisional expires, you're just not gonna get the priority of that earlier filing. You can file any more provisionals you, all you want, and the office was very happy to file and, and take that information, have it filed with an addition, a new provisional application. We are very happy also to take your fees. Uh, having said that, you just will not get the priority of the earlier expired provisional. Okay, thank you. And just a reminder, there is a slide up with more information. If you have specific questions that we don't get to today, you can contact the Pro Se Assistance Center either by phone at the 1-866 number or by email or visit the website to get more information that may have general questions available for you to review and that may answer your questions. But utilize that service. It is a great service. The people who run that center are very helpful. They generally get back to your claim or your question within 24 hours. It is a useful service and it is free. So please utilize that service. Uh, Sudanshu, our next question coming in, if a person is filing pro se and they are not an attorney, is there a reason they have to submit their claims in technical language if their claim can still be understood by an average person reading it? If it is required, what can you recommend for a non-attorney to write better claims? Okay, so claims and technical language. I heard those two uh, those uh, those two words. So uh, let me uh, take a little step back. Generally speaking, your disclosure, your specification, is primarily a technical language of whatever your invention is. The claims tend to be more legalistic language. Um, so having said that, because remember, the claims is where you're getting your legal coverage legal protection. So the claim language is slightly different from the disclosure specification invention language. The disclosure specification language tends to be more technical, scientific, engineering, depending on what the invention is. The claims tend to be more legalistic. Um, uh, in terms of assisting you, we can give some suggestions on how to write the claims, we can give you generalities on how to write the claim. But one of the most important things to assist you in writing the claim, and even for that, uh, for that uh, thing to write a uh, disclosure, I would seriously recommend searching in, in go on Google, search for your terms, keywords, which you think are in your invention, and you put, they put in the word patent, US patent. You will get, uh, your search results will show, uh, you may get already issued, already made public, already issued prior patents. And you can see from your invention, your area, what the language is used to draft the specification and the claim. And you can model your application using that, um, uh, using that language as a template. Also, if you contact us at the Pro Se Assistance Center, we can help you search. I've done, uh, we get a lot of questions. This is a very common question. And we ourselves uh, will do a search, quick search, and send you uh, issued, already issued, links to already issued patents in Google. And, you, and we, we recommend you, you take that, you read it, get an understanding of what's written, how it's written, and then craft your language similar as a template analogous to that. All right, great. The next question coming in, how well drawn do your drawings have to be in your application? I think the drawings need to be quite well drawn. Uh, a lot of the drawings can be uh, done, a lot of people use CAD tools uh, to draw uh, the drawings. A lot of them can just be some boxes with a description and elements shown on it. Um, a lot of, for more complicated things, you may you would want to use a CAD tool to make drawings. If, of course, you have, uh, if you're an artist or know someone 
who is an artist can draft up uh, drawings for you. We recommend that. Uh, we also recommend hand, hand drawings are acceptable as long as they are legible and understandable and one can understand the invention, the nuances and the criticality of the invention while reading the specification. Um, so it all depends on the examiner. It all depends on how, whether the examiner is able to understand, get a feel, view the invention that you're trying to do. Great. The next question we have, what happens when provisional utility application is abandoned? Can someone else then assume my IP and patent it? No, if it is abandoned, it's not made public. No one knows about it. Uh, it no one else can have access to it. Uh, so presumably they can't benefit from it. And this question may be related to that. Will it hinder a person from submitting a non-provisional application if they abandon their provisional application? No. If, you, if your provisional application is abandoned, again, the only thing is you're not going to get priority uh, to the filing date of the provisional, but your non-provisional will be examined thoroughly independently of what you have done in the provisional. The examiners view the non-provisional uh, in, in, in and of itself. There is only, uh, they do not consider the provisional only at times they may consider a provisional if you are asking for priority and if the 12 month period has not expired. Great. The next question is, I thought in the past when a provisional was filed, we were issued a patent pending number. Was that the case or am I mistaken? I don't, I, I don't think there was any patent pending number per se. I'm not sure, but I will say this, that um, you can have a number, a provisional application is given an a, a provisional application number, uh, meaning once you have filed the provisional application, met all the requirements, you are given a provisional application number. I suppose that number can be used as a patent pending number. Okay. Another question coming in related to patent pending. Once you have a patent issued or a patent pending and you find out there's a better way to design your product, can you update your patents with this information? Uh, no, you can't. Uh, you will have to file another application. The, uh, the application, in, in the, that next application will be independent or may claim priority to the previous non-provisional application. But remember, the app, the, if you change the description, if you change your invention, you have to file another application. The next question I have is coming in about the title of an invention. Can the title of the invention be just one word? Yes, it can be. We prefer it not to be. We prefer the title to be a little bit uh, slightly more descriptive just to give uh, the public uh, a better understanding. If your application issues, once you, have, once you go through this whole process, not only for the provisional, but also the process of prosecution as Mr. Nolan articulated in the earlier presentation. Once you go through it, you finally have a patent, you're really happy. It makes us, it makes the public know uh, if they are doing a search, if they want to invent something around what you have invented, it gives a better indication to the public, but of course not necessary. A lot of it will depend on the examiner's discretion. Uh, however, it's not necessary to be more than one word. Thank you. The next question I have is, what if you have an invention that's a variation of the other? Let's say I created a new type of vacuum cleaner, but one has a battery and the other one has a wire. Would each of those products require separate patents or separate provisional patents? Uh, I think that's a very interesting question. I will go back with just the fact pattern that has been articulated. Again, uh, a lot of my answers may change based on the nuance and the details. However, I'll answer this question that uh, in a manner that you may file two applications or the examiner may, file, may tell you to file two applications 
uh, depending on how distinct the inventions are, uh, it, meaning if the vacuum cleaners uh, have a distinction in terms of the size based on the battery or the plug, uh, and if the inventions are in and of itself, if the invention is more in the battery part of it, or if the invention is in the in the vacuum cleaner part of it, it all depends on where the core of your invention is leading to. Um, you can file a single non-provisional uh, for both of them. If the examiner may come back and say, no, I think this requires two separate applications, and there's something called restriction practice, and the exam and those are details you don't have to go into. And the examiner may say, here's a restriction, please file a separate uh, application for this, this the battery-powered one, and then you can file uh, the battery uh, uh, powered non-provision application. And the good thing is you will still get priority to for both of those back to the single provisional. You do not need to have two different provisionals. You may need two different non-provisionals. You may do it by yourself initially, or you may have the examiner may, uh, may tell you to do it during restriction practice when your non-provisional is filed. However, for the provisional, you just need one application. Thank you, Sanantio. The next question I have coming in, can detailed pictures of a prototype be used in a provisional filing in lieu of drawings? Uh, <clears throat> so this is an interesting question. Um, my, it may be used, the reason I say it may <clears throat> is because, um, excuse me, <clears throat> The reason I say may is only for one reason, uh, primarily. Um, a lot of our filings are filed electronically. We have the patent, uh, patent center and now, and I think you will get a presentation on that, uh, I think later on, either today or t tomorrow or sometime. And we have the EFS web system. So a lot of our applicants who are all over the country, maybe all over the world, file electronically, uh, to the Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, photographs are not captured very well. Pictures are not captured very well in, uh, in electronic filings. Uh, you may mail it, but then we have to scan those pictures, scan those documents in, the, uh, in, the, in, in our file, electronic files, and pictures, again, do not come across uh, very well in those scannings, and I can assure you uh, an examiner will probably request better drawings from you when you file it that way. It may just cause more complications. My, my guidance would be, I think you can, as long as the, those uh, pictures are, can be viewed well electronically. Uh, if not, we will ask you to file a drawing that can be viewed better uh, electronically. <clears throat> Thank you. Our next question. Does an abandoned non-provisional patent application count towards the four maximum allowable patent applications for micro-entity inventors? Uh, yes, it does. Our next question, while patent pending, is it safe to perform a group study like SurveyMonkey for marketing reasons to get feedback on product and once patent pending, and once patent pending, is it safe to begin selling online? Uh, I mean, uh, that's a question that I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer uh, in the sense that uh, all patent pending, all I can say is to, in regards to that uh, is all patent pending is, is let the public know that you have filed an application. Now, whether that's a prudent or a intelligent thing to, to do. That I will leave more to the business uh, uh, business experts and attorney experts to answer that in in more targeted, specific manner for for that particular person. Thank you. To answer, I want to thank you for your time and just remind everyone. The slide that you see right now with the information is available to you right now. If you have questions, you can call that number or email innovationdevelopment at USPTO.gov. They will assist you with any questions you may have 
regarding the filing system process or your application. They do not provide legal advice and they do not tell you if your product is patentable or not, but they will assist you and guide you in reviewing your application and helping you prepare the best application possible before submitting your application. At this time, I'd like to thank Sudantu again and remind everyone that all of these programs will be recorded and available online after the program today. If there's anything you have related to a question about the program, you can email us at inventioncon at uspto.gov at any time during the program. We are monitoring that Railbox Live. And at this time, we are going to go ahead and take our first break for the program. This is an hour long break. It will last until 3.10. We hope to see you back at 3.10 for our next presentation, which is best practices for filing a successful patent application. If you don't want to take a break, we will be airing part of our speaker series of Martine Rothblatt, which will be airing during the break. This is not a live presentation. It is pre-recorded, but you are able to watch this during the break period, and we will be starting back at 3.15. I look forward to seeing you all at 3.15, and thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, everyone.